Gorgeous, flawless babes. What's up? Welcome back. Once again, we're here. we isolating. Another week. We got this going on. As of today, so Wednesday, the world is still falling apart. We got coronavirus, racial injustice, the Colston statues in the harbor swimming with the fishes. The economy is a thing. Ah! I know for me, I don't know about for y'all, my heart has been so heavy still with everything that's going on in the world, particularly racial injustice in this country and abroad, and how far it's actually had to come before we're doing something about it. Before we've moved from being like, I'm not a racist, to I'm not a racist and we can't allow racism to exist anymore. But nonetheless, we here, we together, we in different places, we in different spaces, but we're still together. Charles, Charles, I'm so thirsty. Sorry, Queen of All, I come bearing a drink. Thank you, Charles, thank you. Finally, someone who knows our place in this world. Impact never treats me like this. Anywho, so last week we took a break from our regularly scheduled Impact Malarkey to talk about racial inequality, which is a conversation we need to keep having. It doesn't end with one week of having a chat about it, and it isn't a conversation that ends just because a statue's in the harbor. This is a conversation that needs to become action, that ends the systematic racism in our country and in the Western world. And I see y'all, I see you out there being little activists. Yes, I'm all for it. Your social medias are all covered in stuff. I'm doing the exact same thing, but don't let this momentum end with just being angry and posting angry posts. Let this momentum become real and true change to a broken system. So even though we're gonna start continuing in our regularly scheduled stuff, the current feeling in the air, the milieu, everything that's kind of going on will be very much tied into our impact session still. Our faith isn't like some impractical thing where we study these ancient scriptures but they have no bearing on the present. It's that same Holy Spirit that we read about, the same Jesus we study in our Bibles and we read about and we're like, ah, so fascinated with. That same Jesus is just as alive today and just as present today and in our circumstances as he was in the stories that we read about. Amen? Actually, you know what? Let's take a pause in what we're doing right now and we're gonna pray for our world right now. Let's just take a break. I'm gonna close my eyes, you don't have to. That's just kind of how I pray. Lord, we lift you up. Everything that is going on in our world right now. All the injustice we see, all the anger we see. Lord, none of this was hidden from your sight. None of this was something that surprised you. And, and you know this heartbreak better than I do. I know that for sure. Lord, I pray that you'd be comforting those who are feeling really angry right now. That you'd be reminding them that they have a very important place in your kingdom. And in the kingdom of God, no person is greater than the other. That's not the kingdom of God. And Lord, would you always help us remember your teachings. Your teachings to love, to forgive, and to put others ahead of ourselves. Would you teach us how to be people who are marked by love and not people marked by uh, arguments and defense and ah. Uh, just help us be people who are marked by love. Lord, we know that you're present in all of this and keep teaching us how to bring your kingdom here to earth. We love you so much, Lord. And we pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so y'all, babes, let's start everything off with a question today. Question one, can you think of a movie or a book or any kind of story you read that had like a crazy plot twist in it where you're like, what? Like what just happened? Like an M. Night Shyamalan kind of twist in it. Can you think of any stories that have a crazy plot twist? Give this video a pause, discuss with whoever you're watching with. Okay, so we are continuing on on our Pentecost series, Acts, to be continued. So Acts is like the second volume of the Gospel of Luke. So Luke talks all about this like, Jesus guy, he's crazy, he's wild. So he's got this like miraculous birth, AKA the Christmas story. We three kings of our 
So he's crazy. Like, he's out healing the sick. He's raising the dead. He's forgiving sins, turning water into wine. He's challenging the system. He's teaching of like the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. He's got all these like controversial, scandalous teachings. He's wild. He's so wild and dangerous that the system can't have him alive anymore. So powerful elites plot and like plan how they're gonna do away with this Jesus guy who might inspire like an uprising. So he's crucified, a criminal's death. But then three days later, just as he said would happen, he raises again from the dead. He's resurrected. And then he shows up to his disciples and he's like, I'm here and I'm hungry. You got any fish? Gives them some more teaching and then he ascends into heaven. And we're left there like, yes, our hero. Now what? What's next? Where do we go from here? And Jesus' last instructions to his disciples in the book of Acts is to wait in Jerusalem for the gift that the Father sends, which is the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to all the ends of the earth. And that's kind of where we left off, in the waiting. The disciples waiting for the Holy Spirit to come, like Jesus said he would, waiting for his word to be fulfilled. Waiting. So today, we pick up right where we left off. It was two weeks ago, two weeks ago in Acts. So we're gonna be reading chapter two. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, boom. You're in Acts chapter two, a couple pages. Now, as someone with a Pentecostal background, I'm well talked about this verse. Pentecostals, we love this verse. If y'all don't know, I'm from a Pentecostal church back in Canada, which if you don't know what that is, okay, think of like an American movie or TV show where people are at church. They swaying. Ooh, they two-step and they're really into it. The music is awesome. It's like, ooh, a little soulful. Climbing, two-stepping. We get the ladies like waving around their fans. Oh yeah. Men can wave fans too. I've just only seen women do it. All genders can wave fans. <laughs> I keep getting in trouble with stuff. I just can't say things the politically correct way. Anyone can wave a fan. Anyways, Pentecostal church is wild. And Pentecostals love these verses we're about to read today because it is the birth of the modern church. It's like a turning point in history and ushers in the modern way that we see God's spirit move among his people. And it becomes a big theme for the rest of the New Testament, but also for our current and modern lives as well. But I'll stop talking and we're gonna let some scripture do the talking. So if you wanna open up your Bible, Acts 2, we'll start at verse 1. So it says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Hold up, what is Pentecost? Okay, so Pentecost is a Jewish festival. You might've heard of it called the Feast of Weeks. It comes 50 days after Christian Easter, but I won't subject y'all and make you listen to me talk about timing and dating and all that jazz. But I will subject y'all to a little talk on etymology because it's my YouTube channel. Actually, Brittany, um, I don't want to be that guy, but it's actually Redland's YouTube channel. Lawyers, am I right, guys? I'm just saying. I'm just kidding. I actually have the highest love and respect for Alan Barr. And in the time it took me to have that very real disagreement with the very real Alan Barr, I also decided against the etymology talk of Pentecost, so... <laughs> Everyone's winning! So, it's the Feast of Weeks. They're in Jerusalem, they're celebrating Feast of Weeks, which marks the beginning of the wheat harvest. Which is exciting! Farm kids! Forbes! I see you! And it also commemorates the anniversary of the giving of the Torah by God to Israel on Mount Sinai. So, there's feelings in the room. People are excited. There's like... Mm, something going on. Remembering the giving of the Torah, the coming uh, of, the, of the harvest, which is really exciting. So, Let's read on. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing, violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment. Ooh. Bewilderment. Bewilderment! Because each one of them heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us hear them in our own native language? 
Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, POTUS. POTUS. <laughs> You know you watch the news too much, don't you? Pontus in Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans, Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of our God in our own tongues, amazed and perplexed. They ask one another, what does this mean? Some of them, however, made fun of them, saying they've had too much wine. Okay, real talk here. Some weird stuff has just happened there. Let's break it down. So the Bible says they were all in one place. They were all together in one accord, in one mind, heart, spirit. And all of a sudden, they heard a sound like a blowing violent wind and it filled the room. And they saw something that seemed like tongues of fire. Uh, uh what does that mean? <laughs> Have you ever had an experience and you were like, it was like tongues of fire. <laughs> It's like a Rolling Stones album cover or something. This tongue is on fire! But I think the keywords we should be focusing on here is like and seems like. Sometimes when there's no other words to describe an experience, we need to rely on metaphors and similes to help us paint the pictures. So don't read this as like totally literal of like tongues entering a room <laughs> that are on fire. It's using images to try to put words to something that you can't like fully sum up in words. Wind is this popular image for when God is present. The Hebrew word for wind is ruah. <gasps> it's a Hebrew word study time. Okay, today's word is ruah, which is the wind, the breath, and the spirit of God. Have you ever had the wind blow on an autumn day and your hair starts blowing all around and in your face and the leaves are dancing and wrestling about? Or have you ever felt like such a strong wind that you can barely stand against it and it's pushing you? Now imagine an alien comes to earth. How would you explain this feeling to someone who's never experienced it? The thing is, sometimes language is too limiting to explain the nuance of what it means to be a human, to be these spiritual beings, to be here, to be present. Ruach, the wind or the spirit of God. So if it was a really windy day, you would use this word. You'd say, oh, it was really ruach outside today. Or if, if the Holy Spirit of God, that same word is used there. The Bible sometimes struggles to find adequate vocabulary and language to speak about and name this unutterable, irresistible, undomesticated force that surges into history to liberate and heal and remake and transform. And, and we're left with this code. Ruach is the wind that parted the waters and created dry land. It is the very breath of God that was, that was breathed into humans upon creation. It's a spirit that parted the seas and allowed people to escape slavery in Egypt. It is that same spirit that Jesus claims and empowers the early church in Acts. This Ruah that is active throughout all of our sacred stories. And even until today, that same Ruah is here with you. So literally the same word that is used for wind is used for the spirit of and fire. This is the next one, fire. Do we have any Bible passages that talk about fire? Fire! And the Lord being present in fire. So the first one I think of, I don't know if your mind went here too, burning bush. So Moses, where God spoke to Moses through the burning bush on Mount Sinai, where the Lord gave Moses the 10 commandments. The glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire. Wind and fire, I think, Ooh, also this is another one that just came to me. Um, the baptism of Jesus, where John the Baptist says, I baptize with water, but the one who comes after me will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. When we read about this mighty wind, these tongues of fire, we shouldn't be thinking, tongues on fire? <laughs> but we should be thinking, wow, okay, I know these images, wind, fire. I know what's going on here. Something big, something mighty is about to happen. And when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they began to speak in different languages. So the disciples, they're like these Galilean fishermen. And I mean, being from Galilee wasn't like a really popular, cool place to be from. You'd pretty much be despised and held in low esteem. So Judeans would typically look at Galileans as kind of like lower class, uneducated, kind of like hicks. It was maybe like being from Florida. 
Now Florida, it isn't a bad place. A lot of smart people are from Florida. But when you hear a story from Florida, you're always kind of like... <laughs> I couldn't resist. I had to look up news stories from Florida. Florida man calls police to report his wife is a black widow spider. Florida man arrested for a DUI after mistaking a bank drive through for a Taco Bell. Florida man goes to the grocery store with an alligator in hand. Florida. The great state of Florida. So we've got this group of Galileans who are pretty looked down upon. They're probably seen as uneducated and total hicks. And we have this big group of people in Jerusalem from all over the known world. And all of a sudden, the Galilee crew starts speaking in all these different languages. And when people hear the loud sound of that, like, that rushing wind and the tongues of fire, they come and they start to gather in bewilderment. And they all of a sudden start hearing these total hicks speaking these different languages. But not just like any old different language, their own native language. Now that doesn't happen every day, does it? Hello, and today on the news, we got breaking news out of Florida. People started speaking different languages. Here in America, we speak American. Bonjour, comment ça va? Ah, it's très bien. So that's really basically what's going on here. And people are like, wow, what is happening? How is this possible? Like, what's going on here? <laughs> when the Spirit of God came, like Jesus said it would happen, when Jesus said, I'm gonna go, but you're gonna receive the Holy Spirit and be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all of the world, this is what's happening here. In the most clever Jesus way, we would have never saw it coming. It was like the plot twist. Jesus loves a plot twist. Where we left off two weeks ago, they were waiting for the Holy Spirit, weren't they? They were waiting in Jerusalem for that gift of the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised. And I'm a guess, they didn't really know what to expect. What does it mean to receive the Holy Spirit? Like, what is that gonna look like? Am I gonna hear like a worship song and get tingles up my arm? It's a worship leader gonna play the synth while the preacher prays? Am I gonna get really excited? Like start jumping up and down? Am I gonna cry? Like, what's gonna happen? What is it gonna be like to receive the Holy Spirit? And then I'm going to want to go on a mission trip to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and talk about what I witnessed. That's, that's what Jesus said is going to happen. The Spirit of God entered like a wind and with the presence of fire and fulfilled exactly what Jesus said was going to happen in a way that no one ever saw coming. The sign that the Holy Spirit was present was everyone began to impossibly start speaking in different languages. They didn't understand. They didn't learn. They didn't go to like French class. The person you would have never expected to see speaking another language. The uneducated, the Galileans, speaking in people's own native tongues. And what do they do next? It's not what we would do, is what they do next. So I don't speak Spanish, but all my Latina friends, they love teaching me only the bad words in Spanish. I know a lot of bad words in Spanish. But fortunately, the disciples don't do what we do when they've learned a new language. What do they do as we read on? So it says, Peter stands up, he raises his voice, and he witnesses to all the things Jesus has done. He says, oh, no, 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 honey's like, we aren't drunk like y'all thought we were. It's nine in the morning. We're not that wild. We're not those kind of gals. No, this is what Joel talked about. Remember when Joel said, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons, your daughters will prophesy, men, women, children, servants, slaves everyone i will pour out my spirit and they will prophesy he tells the testimony of jesus who lived and did all these wonderful things these miracles but jesus was handed over and put to death on the cross but god raised him from the dead freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible to hold him down and then he was buried in a tomb and resurrected and then he says in acts 2 36 let's read it together Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. 
and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children and for all of you who are far off. It's for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 of them were added to their number that day. Three thousand people heard this sermon saw this miracle of them speaking another language and wanted to be followers of jesus they wanted to be a part of this jesus movement that i saw in front of them when is the last time you heard a friend who was like you know what i want to do go to church man i'd love to be a christian three thousand people were added to the church that day. Not because they played some cool hip worship songs, not because Peter and them were like really stylish and were cool and relevant, had a leather jacket. Not because those Jesus movement guys had a great personality and they were super funny and entertaining and engaging on stage, but because the Holy Spirit showed up. And when Jesus shows up, everything changes. I got another question for y'all. Question two, how do your friends and people at school and in your life view Christians? Is being Christian like a super cool thing or not really a popular thing? Is it a weird thing? How do you, how do people view Christians that you know? Give this video a pause and have a little discussion. Sometimes I think one of the biggest faults the church has is that we limit the way God works. We've got it all boiled down to this formula of how church looks, how it's meant to be, this is what it looks like, this is how God speaks, this is how it's meant to look. You know, you gotta get goosebumps from singing a song or the preacher prayed the right prayer and it hit your heart in some kind of place. And this is how God speaks to people as well. This is a way that he works in and through us. But I think we've also really limited the way the Holy Spirit works and how the Holy Spirit ought to do things. When God is actually much bigger, deeper, wider, more mysterious, and honestly, more clever than all of our feeble attempts to try to box him in. When Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will come on you and you will be my witnesses, I don't think anyone had this in mind. I don't think they were like, you know what God's gonna do? Make us start speaking different languages so we can witness to people. I don't think they had this in mind, but this is who our God is. He doesn't always play by our rules or do things the way we expect. This is the beginning of church as we know it. All throughout the Old Testament, there'd be certain characters and people who would arise and the Spirit of God would rest upon them. And they would do these great, amazing things. So people like David, Solomon, Deborah, Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, and the Spirit of God would be with them and empower them to do these amazing things. Not because they're amazing, but because God is with them. And when Jesus came and he told us that he was leaving soon, but his Father was going to send us an advocate. In fact, even a step further, Jesus said, it's better that I go so that you can be sent the Holy Spirit. And in this time, this Jesus time, people used to always worship in the temple. And the temple was the center of everything. Here's what made the temple so special. If you're unaware, uh, there was this area of the temple surrounded by this like big, heavy curtain. Uh, not like your bedroom curtain, like a bedroom blackout industrial to the power of 10, kind of like thick, heavy curtain. And within this curtain was this area called the Holy of Holies. And it's where they believed God's spirit literally dwelled and resided. At the moment of Christ's crucifixion, it is finished. He breathed his last, the Bible said, the curtain veil tore in two. And when we read it, we think, that's a weird decorative thing to add. Why did Jesus ruin the curtain? And until we read and remember Pentecost, God's spirit being poured out on all people, we don't worship a God who's behind a curtain. We worship a God who is here and present in the midst of all of this. We don't, we don't need a temple. We don't need a collection of bricks and mortar and wood and I don't know, whatever people make churches out of. He has poured out his spirit upon us and the temple is now within his people. We don't worship a God who is like up there and we're down here. We worship a God who is with us, who has made his residence within us. We don't place our faith in something that is far away and not a part of the story. We put our faith in a God who is here, who is present, 
in it all. This isn't a story that is over and ended. No, this this isn't an ancient story that's concluded. Sure, we know the end of the story if, it, if we read our Bibles, but we are still very much a part of what God has going on. We are very much a part of what God is doing even still. And that same Holy Spirit who is enabling them to speak different languages, this same spirit who is in this story that we just read about is also with you. Do not limit God and the way he works based on how you think he ought to work. Allow yourself to be amazed. Allow yourself to live in the mystery. Allow yourself to feel awe. And don't assume things always have to happen the way they happened before. I genuinely believe that if our churches, if our youth groups, our children's ministries remember that it's all about God, it's all about Jesus. Not how cool the ministers are, not how hip the music is, Jesus is the center of everything. I genuinely believe if our churches remembered that we would see an upward trend in our churches rather than a downward trend. We'd see people being added to our numbers like they did in this story. We'd see people coming out of spiritual bondage. We would see all this pain being broken because Jesus is the center of it all. The Holy Spirit is with you. He's with me, but, but the Holy Spirit is with you. Don't limit God on our puny little earthly limitations. Let God take you on a journey. Life is a journey and enjoy every moment of this big, beautiful, wonderful, crazy ride. You're all awesome. That's, that's the end of today's session. I don't have this in my notes, but as I was going on and on with this today, I, I still can't get the general feeling that's in the air right now off my mind or off my heart. The racial injustice, the hurt, the pain, the upset we're seeing in our world today. And as Christians, we are called to be missional people, called to be people who bring the good news of Jesus, and this Holy Spirit freedom that is available for all of us to the world. And I think we often limit that to thinking, I have to go on a missions trip if I want to be effective. I have to go on a missions trip to be missional. But that's not true at all. The missions field is exactly where we are right now. As we hear about all the injustice that's going on, we can't sit quiet. We, we, we defend those who feel downcast in society. We restore what is broken and we restore things to what the kingdom of God wants it to look like. And of course, we're still waiting for Jesus' return and for new heaven and new earth to come. But in the meantime, we're called to bring God's kingdom here where we are. And we, and we can't do it without the Holy Spirit. It's our job to be restoring those who feel broken and forgotten and downcast right now. So yeah, I, th I think that's all I wanted to share. Your life right now is a mission field and treat it like it is. You're all awesome. You're fabulous. You're wonderful. I miss you all. You're world changers, mountain movers, fire starters. I believe in y'all so much. Uh, I'm always here for you as well. If you ever need to talk, have a FaceTime, anything, send me a DM, send me a text. I'm here for y'all. I love you all. You're fabulous. We'll see you next week. Grace and peace.